Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Made in Africa Plug Talk. Um, Made in Africa is a dedicated platform to address African continent major transitions. Uh, we try to facilitate dialogue and promote the dialogue between African operators of innovation, entrepreneurship, development with major industrial or institutional leaders. Today is a great pleasure to present the first plug talk about social transitions with a specific focus on education. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to welcome today three uh, fantastic speakers. Um, I will start with Ms. Anne-Therese Ndongjata, who is Director for UNESCO Multisectorial Regional Office for Eastern Africa. We also have the pleasure to welcome Mr. Tom Chris Emewulu, who is the founder and president of SFAN, and SFAN is a star from all nations, stars from all nations, a great initiative he will introduce to us. And our last speaker today is Mr. Gideon Olan Rewaju. He's a head tech innovator, he's educational development practitioner, and he's the executive director of Area I for Africa. So welcome you, welcome all of you to our discussion today. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, to the participants, don't hesitate to send us any questions, any remark, and we'll try to make this uh, uh, communication as interactive as possible. Uh, perhaps before starting, we can uh, ask each of our speakers to make a small introduction of themselves and what um, is the purpose of their activities around education. So, so to start with, I'm very happy to introduce to you Ms. Anne-Therese Ndongjata, Director of UNESCO. Please, Mrs. Jata. Oh. Oh, thank you, thank you very, Jan. thank you very much, Jan, and thank you um, the the panelists that are with me. Uh, thank you, Angelina. Um, I'm Anteres Nongjata. I have been with UNESCO for 17 years, and prior to that, I worked as the Minister of Education in the Gambia. And then in UNESCO, I have been working at uh, various levels. Uh, I started at the global level, looking at education. And um, through that, we, we had really um, a focus on access, quality, and relevance. And in particular, we started in Africa, as well as in, all, in some of the other regions, a focus of continuity in education and ensuring that um, we would, especially in developing countries, go beyond looking at the classification of primary, secondary, and university, but really focusing on a rights-based approach. How can we ensure we, we reduce examinations, um, focus uh, approach to uh, education to one in which it is learning and quality learning um, for a workplace um, or, uh, integration of uh, students and the workplace uh, for entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, transiting from the global, I then had a specific focus on Africa where I coordinated uh, with different regional economic communities, the African Union on promoting education at the continental level. And here again, there has been a strong focus, especially guided by the African Union, uh, that we must look at um, uh, um, higher education over and above just basic education, because it seems as if uh, we are not able to transit uh, from that lower level uh, to the higher level. And, um, and re most recently, I had a, a specific focus on Eastern Africa uh, and the Indian Island Ocean states, where uh, we now have what we call a multi-sectoral office, which does not only focus on education, but in looking at education, where UNESCO is, uh, is a leader, we bring in other dimensions of ensuring that um, education becomes of better quality, uh, um, which brings in uh, communication and information. How do we communicate about education? How do we ensure that people are aware and sensitized? We bring in the cultural dimension. How is culture impeding access to education and continuity? We also bring in science and technology, uh, the sciences, open sciences, to ensure that um, there is uh, added value in what we do in education. It's not just about counting the numbers, but ensuring that there is relevance. Uh, and uh, recently, there's been a lot in the area of STEM, uh, which also probably, when the conversation goes on, we'll be able to discuss how technology is making a difference 
and uh, I'll be happy to hear what Gideon has to say. And uh, we also look at issues of skills. And I know um, Tom would really be able to really give us a perspective, which is, is a dynamic approach that brings in uh, private individuals and private sector uh, to help guide us in the way we teach and educate our young people uh, so that uh, they will uh, really be able to tackle issues of poverty, issues of inclusion, issues of really, um, uh, what do you call it, development in general. Uh, let me leave it at that, but like UNESCO is, is very interdisciplinary and whatever we do in education touches on these other subsectors that I have mentioned. You know, thank you. Fantastic, very interesting. You raised so many uh, key points uh, of the topics and, and really interesting to see how UNESCO is addressing that on really on the global skills. Um, very interesting to see what you want to really work and, and, and go beyond classification. Um, we observe, and it's really promising to see the development of elementary school. It, it creates a, a, a fantastic uh, pillars for uh, uh, um, and, and great foundation for educational development, but it's not um, uh, enough to raise the opportunity of education for the whole continent. So yes, definitely um, access to education and continuity beyond classification is really uh, 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 key. And, and we'll certainly discuss more about public and private sector cooperation, which is part of, of uh, the plug talk today. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Me Mr. Mewulu, um, please, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit more about SFAN? Thank you so much for the opportunity to have me on the call, Mr. Collinberg. I really appreciate it a lot. As you rightly mentioned, my name is Tom Christian Mewulu. Um, my company is called Stars from All Nations. SFAN was birthed from my own personal experience. Now, to give a brief history, I was working with my big sister in her retail business. In the process of this, we were growing the business. Um, and I read a book called Why We Want You to Be Rich. And the book really gave me some pivotal um, idea of what to do with my life, which is I mentioned that of five things that we can never tax out from society. One of that is education. And as you would understand, without education, we might as well go back to the caves. So I realized that rather quickly that my role belongs in education because I have the passion of helping young people to make their lives meaningful and progressive. And I thought, well, I should go back to college because again, the book mentioned that everybody has to have an understanding of number because our society is uh, mostly cash driven. So I decided to go back to college and study accounting and build an education company in that process, which is how I started working with SFAN but the reason that really sparked it off was I read a report in 2013 that of all 66,000 young people that graduate in Ghana, only 3%, as at that time, it's all data anyway, uh, integrated into formal employment. It got me thinking, so why should I not be at the forefront of making a change and doing something about it? We gathered together and started working around that process of creating a system that could equip people with skills that industry needs. But as you can imagine, when you get on the ground to activate your, your vision and ideas, you begin to see how um, inclusive it could be. We realized that unemployment situation is not only affecting youth in Ghana, but also on the entire continent of Africa, because there is research that support the, the idea that it takes about six years for a college graduate, a university graduate, to find their first jobs on the continent. So we began to iterate our processes and study and research and talk to different partners and getting to make a sense of why the problem is existing and how we can solve it in a more targeted and direct approach. There are several indices that came out in that research. Uh, I will mention some of them as we go on in the conversation. But uh, what we really want to do is to unlock the potential of African young geniuses, as we call them, to help them to turn their passions into sustainable businesses and careers, fulfilling careers. Now, SFAN has been in operation for seven years now. We started by creating an event because that was the immediate activation point of what we could do to get people at different strata in their careers under the same roof to start meaningful conversations. We have what we call the 
Quantum Leap Careers Fair, which we organized with the British Council here in Accra. We've also had it with President Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative, where they select nine of uh, leaders from nine West African countries, bring them to Accra for six weeks and incubate them and train them. We've had that two sessions of it with the, the fellowship. And of course, we've collaborated with organizations like the Holland Embassy to organize the careers fair. But in the process of that, we were listening, we were learning, we were, we were researching. We realized also that it's not only people who are looking for their first jobs that are experiencing that challenge of, I don't know where the jobs are, I don't know what the skills are, I don't know where um, the processes of uh, applying. And uh, early stage entrepreneurs are also facing similar challenges of, well, I have an idea. Who are the people thinking like me? I'm creating something. How do I grow it? I need money to do my operations. We began by organizing breakfast meetings to spark meaningful conversation. But it wasn't enough because there are several indices coming out in the conversations. One of it is the research that was probably saying that on average, um, successful entrepreneurs started their journey at 45 or began to put more discipline around the operation at, at the age of 45. It got me thinking, if we are shunning out 12 million people, according to the African Development Bank, every year on the continent, but only 3.7 million jobs are being created, the only way we can make a definitive impact in that direction is if, if we get our students and young people who are still in school to begin to think about making their lives, taking ownership of their life aspirations by creating businesses instead of graduating with the mentality of looking for a job. So we established the Student Entrepreneurship Week to bridge that gap by getting them to think like entrepreneurs, job creators, and not necessarily job seekers. We've had uh, three editions of it. The first one was in 2018 with the British Council. Again, they sponsored it. Um, it was the first on the, uh, in Ghana. And beautiful thing that happened through the event, we had people coming from other African countries. So we thought, well, if we made it for Ghana, we have people coming from elsewhere. We might as well go to Africa. Uh, essentially, that, that was what we did in 2019 with EcoBank. They sponsored that edition. Um, we had someone coming from India. We, we had speakers from Silicon Valley, the UK, and across different regions. Well, it got, it got us excited also. We thought, well, now we can go global. We might as well build it in Accra and ship it to the rest of the world. And essentially, that was what we did last year. And it was virtual because of the conditions that we all know about. In all of this, we've seen people leverage our platforms. Um, to start their careers, to build businesses and raise funding. We've, we've created over 700 jobs and business opportunities. You mentioned that tracking the numbers is not always easy when there are some external platforms involved. And I, I can attest to that because, of course, that number would be more than that. We've seen people who don't know anything about business come to our uh, development um, programs and eventually they raised up to $100,000. We have a guy from Burkina Faso who attended the Student Entrepreneurship Week. We linked him up with an incubator in Spain. And after that period, he went back to his country in Burkina Faso. He got a contract of about $100,000 and also won an award from UNDP for his COVID-19 application. So these results have been really exciting to us, but there is something also missing. In as much as the training programs are impactful and progressive, one of the things that we realize is that over a period of time, the excitement goes down. Somebody comes in today, he's inspired, he's motivated to do something with his life, but two weeks down the line, he misses that touch. The connection with the coach doesn't always track forward. So we wanted to create something that is more inclusive and sustainable in the form of an accelerator program that we can manage the interaction across the board. Um, we call that ready for work because we believe that coaching is the oldest form of learning. Thought leaders and experts easily pass on their learning to the younger generation in an inclusive way. We've had two pilot sessions of it. Jobs have been created as you would have seen on our website. Now we are scaling it up. We recently raised some funding, $250,000 to be precise, to build a digital accelerator. I will give more information as we go along. And 
our ambition is really very precise. We want to solve the $130 billion um, problem of skills development on the continent. And by doing that, our aim is to create a digital university that will address the challenges of my generation um, in this present time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very clear and um, great story. You know, I love your process. You're really an entrepreneur of education, which is, uh, um, and I will say 2.0 entrepreneur of education because mainly people have addressed education as a, a, a lack of development in Africa or as a need. And you, you address it differently. You address it as an opportunity to build skills, adapted skills for employment. You talked about social impact. You talked about inclusive growth. And, and I think we all share that. It's today, education don't need help. Education needs to be in power to really reach its goal, to be one of uh, um, uh, the most efficient uh, opportunity uh, for all the African development. Great to have you on board with us. Thank you very much. And um, now let's let's take the floor. Let's give the floor to Gideon Olen um, uh, You have a, a, also a fantastic story, and you create aid for rural educational uh, access initiative. You are in the heart of promoting access to education, and we we can't wait anymore to to get your your presentation to know who you are. And what is your journey, Mr. Olam and Wadju will give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if I'm you know, loud and clear, right? Perfect. Go. Awesome. All good. Thanks. So my name is Gideon Olam and Wadju, and I'm from Nigeria. Uh, I'm 27 years old. I'm currently undergoing my doctoral uh, studies at uh, McGill University. I'm doing a PhD in educational studies. I obtained a, a master's degree in international education and development from the University of Sussex in the UK. Uh, leveraging on the Chairman Scholarship of the UK government. But prior to that, I studied biochemistry in Nigeria. And many a times when I share my journey of impact, you know, working on education, both locally and globally, the starting point would be the transitioning from studying biochemistry to working in education. Uh, born in a low-income family, I had, you know, the privilege to enjoy access to education because a teacher believed in me and took me from a rural community to an urban center. And that singular action transformed my life forever. I won numerous scholarships when leaving secondary education to the university. I was very, you know, very young when I got into university and I had a lot of scholarships. And at a point in my fourth year, I had a reflection about the fact that I am achieving at that point in time because of the transformative power of education. What would be the fate of millions of children across Nigeria or perhaps Africa who are continually denied access to quality educational opportunities by a function of who they are or where they are? Because socioeconomic status and geographic location has continually been a barrier to educational access, provision, and delivery. So I felt, what can I do? So with my brain, you know, understanding chemical structures and biochemical pathways, I decided to follow my passion because I saw that online there are, as a then, 10.5 million out of school children in Nigeria, the largest in the world. I think right now they say we have 16 million out of school children. Add that population to what you know, COVID-19 has contributed to having you know, our expanded population of you know, children who are out of school. And that was when I decided to respond to the clarion call of complementing the work of the government and ensuring that those in marginalized communities who do not have access to conventional educational system or the formal schooling system can also develop the skills, the values, the attitude and knowledge to become productive and to be a critical you know, contributor to the growth of their communities. And that was what better aid for rural education access initiative. The vision of the organization is to improve access and quality of education available to poor and vulnerable children in rural communities. When we started in 2014, the model was simple, design interventions to respond to challenges in rural schools. And then between 2017 and 2019, uh, 2014 and 2017, I mean to say, we did a lot of you know, infrastructural intervention, building libraries, laboratories, equipping them, training teachers, doing professional teacher exchanges, just designing programmatic intervention to respond to the uh, defined problems or challenges that affect you know, 
learning outcomes or educational um, attainment in schools. So when I went for my master's degree in the UK, I stumbled on the speed schools, which is very, very you know, popular in Ethiopia, Liberia, and Syria alone. And these are accelerated learning systems that permit you know, educational activities for nomadic populations of, or out of school children. Now, if you're very familiar with Nigeria as a space, we have battled the Boko Haram insurgents for the last 10 years. We have had our educational system in Northern Nigeria affected by religious insurgency and violent extremism. And because of this reality, there was a need to design some sort of an alternative educational system that caters to the educational needs of children who are not in formal education system. And that was when we began to design accelerated learning program that is focused on three things, digital skills, literacy skills, as well as girls' education. And between 2017 and now, what we have done is to organize educational empowerment uh, opportunities outside the conventional classroom learning for more than 26,000 children in 18 communities in Northern Nigeria. So we designed this as some sort of a condensed curriculum deployed to these individuals who are not accessing the formal education system and ensuring that they can develop skills, acquire knowledge, start businesses to become you know, productive, not only for themselves, but for their family, for their communities and the country at large. That is what we focus on at Area High. I've not always been a huge fan of technology because I have a firm focus on rural education. But I believe that technology could then, the thought was technology would exacerbate and expand the continually widening inequality between those who are in urban centers and rural communities. But well, I think COVID-19 opened my eyes. And between March 2020 and today, we have developed more than four different digital services or products focused on rural communities. The first one we did was, some, and that is why I regard myself as an edtech innovator. We designed Nigeria's first mobile adaptive learning platform called DigiLens. DigiLens allows children in rural communities who are denied access to internet, can't afford data, do not have smartphone or digital devices to study on their phone using basic feature phones. By just dialing the USSD code, we have digitized the entire Nigerian curriculum at their fingertips. The ubiquity of small basic feature phone is what we are leveraging on to expand and ensure the widespread adoption of DigiLens. We also de develop something called DigiText. The cost of textbooks and accessibility is a huge concern. So we develop a platform, the first and the largest repository of online textbooks in Nigeria, where students can go on there and access textbook per page, per chapter, on a daily, monthly, weekly, quarterly, or yearly basis. We are also working on something called digital reality, digital reality. The digital reality is to ensure that we can uh, provide virtual learning experiences for people with disabilities using virtual reality. Now, this series of multimodal approaches leveraged on technology is heavily focused on poor and vulnerable individuals. And that is what we are doing, you know, pushing you know, the narrative that even with the new realities of massive school closures and the fact that you know, we have um, a large population of individuals in rural communities who don't have access to digital tools, we can still get education to them. We just need individuals who are passionate and who are deliberate and intentional about the need to ensure that no one is left behind in the acquisition of skills and knowledge to advance societal development. So that is uh, the introduction from my head. Thank you. Thank you, very interesting. Um, we love it. Uh, young and, and, and very pragmatic approach, starting from the reality on the ground. As you, as you say, you, you, you ask yourself, what can I do? And you follow your patient and it brings you to a very uh, adapted processes, design intervention, as you say, building infrastructure, creating opportunity. Um, I would like to also uh, uh, jump on what you say. You say COVID-19 opened my eyes and you, you, you a little bit elaborate on that. Um, I would be very interested, perhaps you can move a little bit further and after we can ask uh, uh, the other speaker, but perhaps Mr. Olenere Wadju, you can tell us a bit more about how does this COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, what did impact about education in, 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 in Africa? The, the pandemic had really an impact in education globally, worldwide, it changed the way to address education and, 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 and it brings to reality how important it is technology. 
um, um, can you can you can you share with us your vision because you have a quite positive approach by seeing it open my eyes and and it showed me a reality so um, I'm very happy to, to hear a bit more from you about COVID-19 and perhaps we can switch to the other speaker on that too. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think one key thing to, to start from is COVID-19 presented a huge challenge to educational provision and delivery, but at the same time, it presented a huge opportunity. And I think depending on the angle or the perspective to which individuals and governments are looking at it, is it that you see it as a challenge or you see it as an opportunity? For me, as someone who has worked extensively within policy practice and research and education, I see it as an opportunity. An opportunity, and I will say that from three points. There are three things that I would take uh, as the central themes that I pick from how COVID-19 impacted education. The first one is that it expanded digital inequity. That would be the first thing. The second thing would be that it amplified the power of remote education of distance learning. And the third one is that it increased us or opened our eyes to see the potential significance of educational technology. And let me start from the first one. Talking about um, how it expanded digital inequalities, it is known that smartphone penetration or internet penetration is on the rise across Africa. However, those who need and should be afforded opportunity to leverage on this revolution are the ones that are you know, lacking the light. Conventionally, many educational systems in Africa do not have you know, strong digital infrastructure to be able to accommodate the need to ensure equitable provision of education leveraging on technology. And why do I say that? When the schools closed, massive school closures in March 2020, you know, schools across the world universally had to close down. It would be noted that only a few countries in Africa had an immediate response of educational provision instantly when the schools were closed. Many of them spent months trying to figure out how exactly to ensure that there will be continuity of learning and our children will not be left behind. And that in itself was great because for some countries, they were able to make provision for a few number of individuals because the transitioning, according to you know, what I know from Nigeria, we are transitioning to radio and TVs, right? So we had a lot of interactive radio instruction and leveraging on uh, uh, remote education uh, using television. However, the question we would ask is, how many of Nigerian children have access to radios? How many of Nigerian children have access to television? So while that provision was made, a large population of the student population was actually excluded from learning opportunity. For example, there was a report published by the Education Partnership Center, a very notable think tank in Nigeria, that two out of three Nigerian children were digitally excluded from remote learning opportunities during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that begs us to continually think about how education sector plans must have a ready-made remote education strategy. And I think that would take me to my next point about you know, COVID-19 amplifying the power and the need for remote learning strategy, right? Beyond the use of radios, beyond the use of television, how do we combine low-tech, zero-tech, and high-tech approaches to ensure that the educational system can concerted respond and equitably respond to educational needs during humanitarian emergencies? In 2014, we saw what Ebola did in Syria, alone, Ethiopia, and Liberia, right? Nigeria was so lucky that you know we were able to curb that you know early you know. However, uh, COVID-19 came again as another form of humanitarian emergency, and for countries like ours that do not have a stronger existing strategy, we are now beginning to have conversations on the need for you know having a ready-made template whenever the educational system is in crisis or there is a conflict situation. This is the right thing to be done. Now, education in emergencies is an emerging field, right? And we see that countries are continually investing in research to understand how can we you know, use our contextual realities to provide opportunities that ensures that no children or no child is left behind when we have situation of conflict or crisis. Now, the last one would be the increased use of educational technology. Prior to this time, uh, the use of technology for educational provision within classrooms or outside classrooms 
might not be popular in developing countries. And Nigeria is a huge one, right? We have a large population of teachers who do not even know how they can leverage technology for teaching, for deployment of the curriculum, for assessment, for feedback. However, a new era, I wouldn't even call it a post-COVID era now because COVID-19 is still very much around, right? We are now beginning to, talk, to think about returning to learning. Because of that understanding, we are seeing that countries now are beginning to see how can we adopt technology. And away from you know, the government, I want to talk about some critical mass of individuals who played a pivotal role during the COVID-19 pandemic, and that would be the non-state actors. Individuals like myself, nonprofit organizations, civil society organizations, and air tech innovators. We had a large proliferation of air tech solutions, both relying on internet and not relying on internet. Now, for example, I gave instance of how we built Digilex and we built DigiCloud and we built Digitex. We are not the only individuals who did this across Africa, across the world. We saw that individuals, corporate organizations responded. But there is a key thing that happened there, and that is public-private partnerships. And that is to, to, to emphasize that when there is a societal challenge, understanding the need that we can bring both public individuals and private sector together to come to galvanize efforts together can make a pivotal difference. For me, in Nigeria, I say we are not trying to take over what the government is doing. We are complementing and supplementing the effort of the government. And that reality is why we are coming from the angle of leveraging on the power of technology. We are yet to realize or to maximally leverage on the power of technology in educational provision. And I think what COVID-19 has shown us will be that if we can understand how we can do this better, then the goal of having every child having access to equitable quality and inclusive education by, by 2030, according to the SDGs, will be achieved. So let me recap again, three things that I have picked from how COVID-19 impacted education in Africa. The first one is that it, has, it expanded educational inequities. The second one is it amplified the power and significance of remote learning. And the last one is that it increased, you know, the continual and widespread adoption of technology for educational provision, either outside the classroom or within the classroom. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> great, <laughs> fantastic. Um, um, I think, you know, positioning TV radio inside educational system is definitely uh, uh, an important resilience and the demonstration <clears throat> uh, uh, um, of um, how to, 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 to build opportunity from very uh, difficult and, and, and critical situation like this pandemic. Um, you also talk about public private sector, all of these cooperations, keys. Um, I, I want to give the floor to Ms. Ndong Jata, perhaps. Do, do you have anything you want to, to add to this impact of the pandemic, particularly in the way you address uh, your, your activity in the ground? Perhaps you, you want to, to, to add something to, to this presentation? Yeah, Mrs. thank you very much. And thank you, Gideon. I think um, that that passion is what we need in education. Um, really, um, and the, the COVID exposed uh, the need for change, as you have highlighted. Now, what UNESCO did is to some extent um, aligned to your thinking. Uh, we open up uh, for what we call a global um, education coalition, uh, where all these uh, big names in tech uh, came together, including some of the, the different uh, UN agencies and uh, donor community to really look at how to respond. And through that consultation, it's, it's, it's just unimaginable how most of these um, uh, tech companies, we are ready to offer um, support. And in Africa, we mobilize um, the tech companies to come together uh, and to really engage on the solutions country by country. For instance, in, in Eastern Africa, we took them to each of the country where government and the, the, the tech companies and uh, um, the, the in-country donors uh, had a dialogue and countries made choices of what they want to do. Um, uh, Microsoft, for instance, uh, was really very open and ready uh, to really provide its office uh, 365. Uh, to governments, most of them, like you said, didn't even know um, 
uh, how to use uh, this technology. And so there was training um, at the level of government, uh, the Ministry of Education, at the level of, um, uh, um, you know, the level of teachers, we try to really bring teachers together. But there's a point you have made, and this is very crucial. Much as that was happening, we also saw that uh, there were lots of um, inequalities and there were lots of challenges with most of our governments who do not really have the, the right bandwidth across uh, to reach the rural population. And you would recall that the SDGs is about leaving no one behind. So what, it ha what happened was, there was this gaping reality of the uh, millions of young people that were left behind, uh, the millions of teachers that were not able to engage and really continue education. So in, in a situation of emergency, we know that we even have um, this, this, this pet phrase of education can't wait. And therefore, the focus was looking at what can we do to ensure that education will continue? And um, yes, uh, there were the traditional approaches that were used um, through radio, television, and even uh, you know books, uh, distributing papers, just the old fashioned way. But even with that, it excluded so many. And UNESCO had now been looking at offline solutions. So it would be nice uh, after this session is, thank you, Jan, you brought us together. I would really like uh, Gideon to link up with us uh, because we are looking at a lot of offline solutions. They take, for instance, um, we, we, we are promoting digital libraries uh, and it's offline. Uh, once you have the, the kit at the, at the school level, they can really access it. Initially, when we thought of the digital libraries, we were looking at refugee camps, but COVID has made us realize we just have to move away uh, from this um, brick and mortar infrastructure to looking at technology. Now to do this, uh, we have to look at solutions, uh, mixed solutions. And um, it, it brings me to a, a pet idea also I had as, as, as a minister of education, when I had to grapple with the issues of inequalities and exclusion. I had always dreamt of the day when technology should be able uh, to really help us get everybody on board. And the time is now. Let's not only look at the classical notion of schools, the way they are, children leaving school, and there are lots of other challenges um, uh, that we have to deal with in terms of uh, social, so, social norms. Uh, there is the issue of early teenage pregnancy. This increased during the COVID period. There is the issue of violence, uh, uh, which also increased during the COVID period. One way of curbing this for the tender years when children have to learn is to bring back parents to understand their role and how they can support uh, uh, children. You may want to say, oh, how is it possible in the rural community? Let's stay with the rural education process. And uh, we have um, uh, recently also engaged a particular uh, uh, company that is like Curious Learning. And what they have introduced is mobile learning. How do we use mobile phones to even uh, address issues of um, early childhood? And the mobile phone would be belong to the mother and you put on the apps at a particular time where the mother can allow the child to play with this, with this uh, um, little device and in the process would learn. That is also coming up. I, I also want to give an example of um, the work we did with Elon Musk, where again, well before COVID, Elon Musk was looking at how do we really uh, um, popularize education and learning, uh, especially for rural communities. And we, we did a test case in Tanzania where certain um, uh, tech companies and uh, software uh, developers um, were, 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 were kind of brought together in the form of a competition. You know, uh, normally Elon Musk does a lot of that with XPRIZE. So they competed and they developed a software uh, that uh, could be used to help children who are not able to access school to learn a basic reading, uh, mathematics and language. And it's phenomenal what happened. In very remote areas where you don't even find cars going regularly, they were able to set up this mechanism. And I think this is also very true for uh, what um, uh, Tom Chris also mentioned. These were, and these are first-hand information. It's not like story told. We witness it. 
children were supported um, to access uh, technology offline because what they did was they had the software loaded um, and uh, there were servers in various villages and the local communities were taught how to, to help the children charge their devices and how they could then access the content. And uh, it really did it. So I believe um, what we have witnessed during COVID is, 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 is an eye opener, <laughs> like has been referred to by Gideon. It is telling us that our methods are very archaic. They're very old fashioned. I am not really speaking against schooling. I am saying there should be a different form and way in which we would really provide education at the lower levels. And then even at the university level, there are also new ways. I give a story also with the experience I had in uh, the Francophone West African countries where we are working with universities. And at the time, UMWA, which is a regional uh, bloc uh, to support uh, the economic development of the Francophone countries, came up with this idea that we should introduce technology at university level. And huge sums of money went into setting up you know, connectivity for the universities and supporting the training. But there was so much resistance. Resistance because the university professors felt, oh, they're going to lose something about tenure and stuff like that. And it's only now it's occurring to them that, oh, we missed an opportunity. So with you, we are going back to the drawing board to say the infrastructure was laid, cables that were supposed to really run across the country uh, to support universities. And we had a university hub. Today, with the, the advancement of technology, we can even do more. Uh, recently, also, we were able to say it's not just about technology in the way of looking at a gadget. It's about the content that you can really, you know, sort of access in changing how we really do a lot of things, not only within the universities, but also even in government. And this is artificial intelligence. It's a reality. What we are doing, training university professors to understand what artificial intelligence is all about. You know, I mean, be it in terms of responding uh, to medical, um, emergencies, be it in terms of responding to, to food security issues, post harvest losses. It's, it, it's just, it, you know, you cannot just really begin to understand the opportunities that are there. But what is the challenge? The challenge is we have to change the mindset because, you know, hitherto, all we saw were structures and uh, mechanisms uh, that were only rolling out the same old approaches without engaging to look at what learning is about. And UNESCO had done that in learn education in the, in the 21st century, where it says there are four pillars of learning. It's learning to know. And unfortunately, the learning to know is very limited in that we do not allow this interrogation of what we know so that we can move on to learning to be. And learning to live together it's also very much dependent on the knowledge we have and the interaction with our environment. And so therefore, as we look at the challenges, yes, learning to know will continue, but we should look at different ways in which we must introduce learning and knowledge. We must move into learning um, to, to do. Uh, um, and this is where I see also some Chris coming in. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is not, is, is not what will change society. If we want to transform Africa, we must work on application of knowledge and scientific knowledge at that. And the way to do it is not just going to pay high fees in schools and for which afterwards you won't have a job. You must bring in the element of entrepreneurship. We did a, a certain sampling with, um, with Germany that gave support to what we, we, we introduced at the university level uh, it's called STEP, which is Students uh, Training for Entrepreneurship Development. And we tested it in a number of schools. Take, for instance, in, in Djibouti, uh, the, the president was able to create a fund uh, that young people could access in a very creative way uh, to really engage. And the policies, uh, uh, let, me, let me talk about it. The policies of government is what can change the environment. And where government is saying, look, you can do, come together young people, 
in groups uh, to really work on solution A or, or solution B, just like Gideon is doing. So what Gideon is doing will continue to be a struggle unless government sees it, picks it up, and takes it to another level. Otherwise, it won't happen. What Tom Chris is doing, similarly. So what I'm saying is I'm here advocating for these young people doing the, the interesting and innovative things that they're doing to be picked up by government, to be picked up by partners. And I'm inviting both Gideon and Tom Chris to really explore what can we do together. UNESCO is very open. And this is what UNESCO is about because we lead the, the, the SDG4, which is for education. And it, it, what underpins this is we should leave no one behind. And education should, is a right. And we must ensure that quality goes along with it. But it's not only to focus on quality education. It's education for what? It's education for um, employment. It's education for improvement of one's social standing. It's education for eradication of poverty. It's education for health. It's education for innovation and technology. And so really, uh, as UNESCO, not a very um, financially endowed organization, we build the networks and the partnership to make things happen. But my message would be to the government. The government must accept that change is necessary. It's no longer the old fashioned way of saying, I have uh, cabinet ministers and uh, I have ministries and I have this structure. It's about interacting with the private sector and civil society to understand what are the needs and then build upon that to look for solutions using young people because young people are thinking differently and thinking very fast. Like you can see from a modest situation in, uh, that um, uh, um, Gideon found himself, he was looking at how do I solve problems, not for uh, me alone, but for my community. And the same applies to what Tom Chris has done. So for me, I'm, I'm very encouraged and, I, I, and I, I really feel you know privileged that I have this opportunity to meet these two young minds looking at issues that should solve our problems in Africa. So it's not for want of capable people. It's, one, it's, it's rather a lack of policies that engages young people and the private sector to make a difference. If we can do that, I believe COVID can come and go, but COVID will not shake the foundation of, uh, of society if we learn to do things in the way uh, we, we are just sharing today. Let me leave it to that and uh, maybe we can continue on, but COVID has exposed the realities we talk about all of these. We have all sorts of conventions and governments who sign and agree to them, but they do not implement them in a way that is inclusive. So the first message would be, how can we, as a result of the experiences of COVID, ensure that everything we do is really people oriented and is targeting the poor, is targeting the rural, and is targeting persons with disability. Again, this has been mentioned uh, uh, by Gideon. So all of these applications can really uh, be taken to scale, starting here in Africa, in our con various countries. And you have partners, and this is probably what uh, you must look at also, the two of you. You have partners within the UN system as well, not only the donor communities, because the donor communities can give you the money, but we can bring in a lot of uh, wider experiences to really help you see beyond uh, the money, because for me, it's not the money. And then finally, for young people, I don't think it's all about just jobs. It's, uh, the, the young people also want to feel, you know, like valued to be able to contribute to society and transition. But most of the time, we only think of money. Do we create the enabling environment where young people are able to interact both with government, the private sector, and um, you know, like experienced individuals like you have brought together to share their knowledge, their experiences, learn from them and start to be more creative and innovative in order to feel valued as a member of society. It's not about wealth. You know, I mean, we get you know, so caught up with issues of wealth that we forget the people. A wealth is, is just really something that is um, quantifiable. But at the end of the day, how do we impact lives? It's not about the money. 
it's about the change that we can bring to make someone feels, uh, feel valued uh, and, and uh, a part of society. And I believe that's what your plugin is about. How do we create this transition? In, in UNESCO, we have what we call social transformation. How can this happen? It's really by opening up the doors for young people to engage and draw uh, resources uh, from uh, experience, minds, government, and the private sector alike. Thank you. Yes, totally. Um, um, you, you raised so many important points, and, um, and, and the key one is really to address this transition, to, to change the mindset, to change the paradigm. And, and, and what I really love is you promote this fact that the dialogue between Tom, Gideon, and yourself is key, is central today. We need to have this dynamic in between uh, uh, general institutions who have this uh, regulation and, and global influence actions to bring together um, uh, uh, political leader institution, but with local entrepreneur. Tom, um, let's see with you. Perhaps you, you want to add anything about this COVID, but I think we, we had very interesting um, uh, information and in how the COVID has play a key role in, in, in showing that the model today is not adapted and this transition period is key. Uh, so if you have anything to add to that, please do not hesitate. But I would like to, to uh, uh, also add another point, a, a question to you, because you, you build stars from all nations in Ghana in response of the mismatch between skills, educations. Um, we had Gideon just before we explained to him he has this chemical uh, 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 background, uh, educational uh, activity, but he also went to, to UK to follow uh, over, over skills and over educations. So what is today, Tom, uh, um, the main skills that um, are really well established and graduated inside Africa and can be duplicated and pass it on, and which ones need to be reinforced? Uh, as I've done Gideon by bringing from UK a strong knowledge is sharing now um, uh, to his compatriots. So um, um, anything about COVID, please let us know. And where are we now today in skills uh, around African uh, uh, graduated um, uh, uh, people? Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Colimber. Um, uh, firstly, let me start with the COVID uh, dynamic. Now, as has been highlighted by Madame Jetta and, and Gideon uh, quite accurately, the COVID situation did three things in my opinion. For so long, there has been this conversation and argument around the inclusion of private sector in content design and diversification of education provision and training partnership. Now, that has been something that is prominent. We've seen that um, it's, it's important for so long there's been conversation, but little action in that direction. So COVID has made it possible for everybody to see the need to get that conversation um, going properly and, and, and frontal. The other side of it is, you know, uh, I'm speaking really under the authority of Madame Jetta who works in education at the forefront in policy and, and all of that. Uh, but you see, we are in an era where academic qualification seem not to uh, suffice as a test for competency and discipline, right? And nations across the world are beginning to ask themselves and policymakers alike, what is education today? If people graduate with qualifications that no longer suffice as a test for discipline and competence, as we saw in the news, um, SM, SMBC, I suppose, MSNBC uh, or CNBC listed over 20 companies that no longer require college degree as a test for competence before they employ people. Of course, we, we have you know, seen this conversation going on and we know that the model we use in Africa for the most part is over a hundred years old. So it doesn't solve the need of today's uh, challenges. Now with the COVID presenting these opportunities as I see them, companies and uh, con continents and countries are realizing the need for platform ownership and local content design to really address the challenges that their scholars 
and young people are facing. So that's where S fund comes in, you know, because sometimes people think that young people are supposed to be on the receiving end. And then we are contributing to the problem. I've seen the discussion around population and all of that. But you see, we, the youth, bring a fresh perspective, an uncommon insight, right, into the equation. Take s as an example. You talk about mismatch of skill. We've seen three issues, which is why the persistent discussion around lack of jobs and lack of access to jobs, even when the jobs are available. Number one is that, of course, there is the mismatch of skills, what people are graduating with from colleges and universities and always what the industry needs. The second one is that if we train everybody, there are not enough jobs to absorb them. So we need to get people to become entrepreneurs. We need to get young people to create businesses, to create opportunities for other uh, people who are looking for jobs. Of course, this, the third one is the support services, which I call coaching and support and mentorship. Now, those, those tripartites, if we are able to capture it into this program design and curriculum provision, I think that's what is going to address the issue of unemployment um, across the continent and, of course, across the world. So how do we participate in that? We've realized that it doesn't make sense for program uh, providers like education institutions idea of need to learn before they graduate. And then they get that reality shock when they graduate that their skills aren't requisite for what the mm -hmm. jobs on the ground require. So mm -hmm. do we bring the private sector into that conversation to help with content design? Yes. And it's been effective on our side. So what skills are we looking at? Before I go into that, let me read out a few numbers that would interest everybody on the call to know. Globally, 2.6 trillion US dollars has been uh, spent in education in terms of workforce training and post-secondary school um, skills development. The second one is that if you break that data further, $3.8 billion of that went into MOOC, uh, Massive Online Courses, Creator Courses, Test Preps, and institution uh, skills like coding. Now of that, $9.9 .9 billion went into global micro and alternative education certification. So this is, this is a trend, right? Education as we know it today has evolved. We can look at COVID as a spark, but we know this is a conversation that has been going on for a very long time, but hasn't been taken much serious. So the need is here now. And the reality shock is that the platform is not ready. So companies like mine, and I appreciate what Madam Jetta said about the partnership. I think that the, the real issue is government policy that is designed with a purpose. And what does that mean? How do we empower those who are already actively working at the grassroots to provide the proven, proven solutions that are addressing the challenges instead of buying wholesale uh, solutions from elsewhere? And you can look at any country. If we can galvanize active players at the grassroots and help them to scale the operation by providing maybe advisory, interventions, uh, market access, or funding, right? So that will help to bridge the gap of maybe massive, uh, uh, massive uh, education for everybody, which is not leaving anyone uh, behind. Now, looking at the skills, we've been researching for about seven years of our work now. We've been asking companies, what are those mismatched? What does it mean? What skills are missing? And that's your question. They are broken into three. The first is people skills, or what we call the professional skills. The second one is the job-specific uh, skills, which is maybe somebody who wants to uh, work as a product manager has to know what the job entails. If you hire an accountant, he should be able to balance your books, right? We all know that. But of course, there is, this, there is the third one, which is not always emphasized. We call it the self-reliance skills. So this could be some things like self-awareness, being purposeful, uh, self-belief, being realistic. If you look at young people today, 
you canvass whatever country you are looking at. The biggest problem that young people have is the simple word, direction, right? And direction in terms of being resourceful, direction in terms of willingness to learn, because UNESCO published a report, I think last year, it says that people are in school, but are not learning. But again, you look at the report by African Development Bank at the early part of 2020. It says that a lot of people who are entering the job market have more skills, are overqualified, that's the word they use, right? So the willingness to learn comes in in the approach of if we can get people to know that their life is in their hands, really, and also get, give them the access to the industry, which is, um, we call it the project-based learning. That's, that's the word we use. But it's not every young person who has that mindset of create, taking ownership of their, their thoughts, their reality, and their direction. So that's another skill that employers are looking for. Um, today, as you see with the competition in the industry, disruption in global trade, and increasing competition due to market adoption and technology, the, the challenge is that no employer wants to hire somebody he needs to train for six weeks or six months or whatever the case might be. They need somebody who comes in and start running, right? And take the business like it's there. This is a skill that is not on, but it's been what we call the project-based learning. If we can expose people to idea of what they need to be doing in the workforce, before they get them to be prepared. Now, of course, the other side of it, on the, say, still on to network. It, this might seem so basic, um, depending on who is listening, but networking, as we know, is crucial. If, we, if, we, if you look at any industry, you look at the top performers. Why are they the top performers? Is it because they are more skilled than others? Most times, no, according to the research we've done. Most times, is ability to have the right kind of environment the right kind of people, the right kind of contact. If you look at entrepreneurs who are stealing money across the continent, there's a data published which says that a lot of them, the majority of them have at least a college degree, right? What does that mean? They were in the right kind of environment. They had the right kind of network, maybe access to funders, maybe access to um, uh, workforce, which is staff. Now, networking has become crucial today with the disruption and movements of people, uh, different government mandated policies. Can we create digital platforms that give people access? The answer is yes. And uh, we've seen it work through our program. Creating that community of like-minded individuals who can share ideas and challenge one another and give people uncommon insight is actually very crucial especially in propping up early stage uh, entrepreneurs or entry level workers. The other side of it, still on the self-reliance skill, according to our research, is what we call planning action. Well, how do you commit to your commitment? A lot of times, the, the, the definition of achievement, hello, can you still hear me? I think my network is dropping a little yes. bit. Okay, you. yes. Yeah, thank you. So uh, planning action, as we call it, is that commitment to one's commitment, which is if I hired somebody, how do I ensure that they are progressive and productive on the job? So these are some of the skills that we bonded into our training. The challenge is how do we design content that address these skills, improve them, and help people to demonstrate that they have it? You can easily demonstrate job specific skills because if I recruit someone to be a tech developer, to be a programmer, to be an accountant, I can measure that. But as everybody on the call will attest to, being a very good programmer isn't always what makes people successful. They have to know how to relate with others. Now, these components are not easily, easily measured or easily demonstrated be at the face value. The test becomes the issue. So how can people demonstrate that they've improved in this direction? Maybe in seeking for a job. So that's where we're working really hard on with several research that we've done, with several uh, pilot projects that we've conducted. 
we've been able to, uh, in our own right, perfect a tool that helps people to understand their readiness for employment and easily access tools and materials that are designed to really improve some specific field that they can need to activate their, their life, either in finding a sustainable means of employment or building a business that creates opportunities for others. So in summary, the first is we understand that Africa needs to train 750 million people under the age of 20, 400 million adults who cannot read and write. And of course, there is a, a massive number, which is where we're working, 750 million people who don't know how to access opportunities or who need to improve their skills to find um, a job. So we've seen this as a challenge that the COVID situation brought to the forefront. Not necessarily that this is when it started happening because it's been going on, the conversation has been there, but it has given it to us at the face value for everybody to see. And it has also been able to shake off, like Madame Jetta was saying, those beliefs that yes, we need to keep it, keep it as it is. It has been able to get people to sit on their foot. So the, the demand for whether policymakers or program designers is to create local platforms and local processes and frameworks that can address specific needs of their people. And I believe that what we are doing at ESPAN has proven to be a reliable module. How do I know that? You can go to the features section of espanonline.org slash blog. You go to the features, you see lots of young people who have you know, leveraged our program, our platform, our, our processes to launch their careers. Beside that, you know, people ask me, how do we get funded? We got funded from a local investor here in Accra. And that says two things. One is that it, it, it's not easy for somebody who knows you to lie about you. The result of our work shows that our programs work, right? Our framework addresses the challenge. And that's why the person who knew us was able to fund us. And it says another thing that we are in the right direction. If we can empower these young people with the skills and opportunities they need to engage the real world, we believe that magic will happen. And if we can do it, at this level, imagine what will happen if we get UNESCO and other development partners and institutions to join us you know, in scaling up our work. If we can achieve it in 10, we achieve it in 100. If we achieve it in 100, we went as much as, you know, you can go to the numbers on about us, you see our activities have impacted over 20 million people. You know, so success is really very basic in understanding. If it works in 10, it can work in 100. If it works in 100, it can work in 1,000 a, a and a million, 10 million. So we know the problem. We have seen the solution that works. It's time for action. It's time for a partnership. Government policy doesn't have to be forceful. The research is there. The paperwork has been written. There's a, gro a growing body of research that says the best practices in government policy is not always the top-down approach. And it's not always the, uh, the government policy that is always being implemented by the actors. Can you elevate programs and systems that work and provide advice and best practices that can, they can utilize to scale the operation? So in a sense, the government policy that works is one that is purposeful in activating or serving as a catalyst in propping up the ecosystem of where the policy is being implemented. So I would uh, give the floor at that point, but I'm happy to put a few more research that we've done out there and respond to any specific questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Your patient is the driving force. And I, you, you raised yeah. important point. Yeah, can I just ask a yes. question? Please. OK, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, Tom Chris for that uh, passionate um, presentation. Now, the, there's one little thing I'm looking at. And uh, although, you know, I don't have much uh, 
uh, to add to what you have programmed. I'm also looking at the present situation and context where self-learning uh, should really be one of the things you should look at, where the, your platforms would be a to-go place where young people can also, um, with a small fee, uh, pick up any of your programs and really build on their own competencies. Um, I, I am looking at a future where we are not looking at bringing them together, but really allowing uh, digital literacy and technology uh, to, to provide the learning that is required, both in terms of knowledge, both in terms of skills, and the, then the rest will follow. Because as they acquire knowledge and skills, then they will be able to get to the point of self-actualization. They will then begin to understand wh why in what they do and what they know can be invested in helping people to live together. I'm still on those pillars of education. I'm looking at how we reimagine uh, um, uh, um, education uh, through new lenses that use digital literacy and technology for learning to happen. And, uh, and you can have different solutions that need not necessarily be dependent on uh, um, internet. You can also look at low tech as has been mentioned by Gideon, but definitely I don't want us to go back to a system that is based on classification. Schooling as we know it is very militaristic, where you are now saying you wear the same uniform, you sit in a particular way, you, you do this at this time. I think with technology, it's learning conveniently, anytime, anywhere, and building up from there. And if we can create that future, I think there are lots of other things that will be possible. Because the, the idea of entrepreneurship, it's entrepreneurship that does not really necessarily um, factor in job for money. I said that and I want to repeat it. Entrepreneurship to improve the lives of others around you, it, to be able to, okay, privately continue learning. And in UNESCO, we say it, it's lifelong and life-wide. Uh, you can continue or right up to um, the, uh, the moment when you're about to really kick the bucket, you are learning because it, it has to be informal, non-formal. It can be uh, formal as well, but we must move away from this regimentary approach of providing education to one that is more flexible. It goes with uh, um, the, the availability of technology, et cetera, et cetera. If that can happen, and if that movement is promoted in Africa and across the world, I think there'll be less dependency. And uh, we would not be calculating how much money went into building uh, this infrastructure of brick and mortar, but it would be how much uh, um, government in partnership with uh, the likes of you are able to make people happy. You know, I mean, I also still subscribe to education for happiness. So how are we contributing to that? Uh, um, it will be very important. I would like to know whether you are re really exploring how technology uh, can really break this present cycle of getting people to move from one place to another, traveling from one point to another. Uh, you know, I mean, COVID has told us we don't have to travel. Like right now we are having this conversation. I'm at home in the Gambia, you are wherever you are. And uh, uh, Jan is somewhere in Paris, but it has not stopped us. So we must break that, that mindset of depending on uh, all structures and mechanisms uh, to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Perhaps Gideon, you want to add something on that, particularly, you know, opportunity for cooperations, we know yeah. the role of ICT is definitely key. Yeah, how to definitely. implement that, how to, how to move forward. Yeah, I just want to say something very, very short and quick. So when I, you know, rebranded the vision of Area High in 2000 and, um, 2019, the vision was very simple. Reach 1 million out of school children in Nigeria, leveraging on three things, innovation, technology, and collaboration. Now there's a huge emphasis on that collaboration because like, Madam former minister mentioned, uh, it is important because whatever we design as 
organizational practices and interventions would not be effective without uh, favorable governmental practices, right? And the ability for government to be able to, you know, complement our effort. If as an NGO, you can reach 10,000 with the support of a government, you can reach millions. For example, uh, the DigiLens platform that we build that enables learning on SMS and USSD, got the support of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust and One Young World in London to build the platform. And we were reaching 5,000. And I felt, okay, it is, for me, I've represented Nigeria as a youth delegate to many educational fora, And I feel that kind of association would be important. So I reached out to the state minister for uh, education. And in one week, we have about 5 million Nigerian students who were using the platform. They didn't give us money. We didn't ask for money. We didn't ask for resources. But they have the platform for amplification of such a solution that we've developed and built. And that is one critical thing that I think the combination of technology and collaboration can do when we have homegrown solution, right? Coming from the concept of Afro-capitalism, you know, designing tailored and contextualized solutions to African challenges, we would need to leverage on the two other things, which would be technology as well as collaboration to be able to scale that impact and amplify the reach. Now, beyond just governmental organizations, there's a critical contribution that individual um, institutions like UNICEF and UNESCO can do. You do not need your professionals or practitioners within the system to catalyze the needed change. There are external forces, and all you have to do will be to embrace them. So um, for my other man, I, I, I've been working with UNESCO, so I was part of, and I'm still part of the UNESCO ESD Young Leaders Forum, and the provide support for young individuals who design, uh, you know, uh, interventions and programs around education for sustainable development. I think if we have all of these institutions, if they continue to create very definitive platforms and systems to incubate, to identify, incubate, and scale youthful ideas, youthful and proven solutions, I think the world will be a better place to live. Because just like Tom said, the solutions are there. But how can we take it from 10 to 10,000 to 10 million, which is highly possible? So I think that is one key thing that we need to begin to, you know, and I need to say a big shout out to Angeline as we are on here, she's already, you know, activating the need for us to keep the conversation going on the need for scale. So I think that would be my contribution on that. Contribution. Please, make one your conclusion, make your conclusion. The strength of formal education system over time has been three things, curriculum, teaching and assessment. Curriculum, teaching and assessment. Now, in the COVID or the post-COVID era, there is a huge need for emphasis in developing competence of government to further improve on those three things. If the world would continue like this, there's a huge need for us to now transition those three things online. How can we ensure children or learners can access curriculum online? How can we develop the capacity of our teachers, our teaching forces across the African continent to be able to leverage on technology to educate our children so fast, so well, in a very uh, you know, blended learning structure. And the very last thing is assessment. Just like Madam has said about you know, the, the structure, learning to do, learning to be, learning to become, there's a huge need for us to invest in formative assessment or summative assessment, either one, to ensure that our children are not just sitting before computers, using mobile phones, accessing learning content, and it's not contributing to their self-development. That will be my concluding uh, statement. Uh, it's been a wonderful time being on the call. Thank you so much. I'll reach out to both Tom and then um, Madam Minister at the end of the call. Thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Great, great to have you. Thanks for your contribution. Have a very good afternoon. Take care. All right, let's continue just a few minutes before because I think time has been running, but we are, we'll have over plug talk and, uh, and, and we will share the uh, contact detail of of the different speakers, so you can you can post it together. Um, Tom, before giving a, a last word to uh, Miss Ndongjata, perhaps Tom, you you want to come back to what I've been saying by uh, uh, um, Anne Therese, and 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 perhaps you want to add something uh, uh, as a conclusion uh, uh, relating to your intervention. I give you the floor, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kalimba. So. My, my concluding remarks will be that um, the need to equip young people with skills, and not just skills, like Madame Jetta says, access to meaningful sources of livelihood. 
the need has been so pronounced. And again, unemployment across the world has been called an economic crisis. And it's very simple. If we don't take proactive and direct approach in tackling this challenge, nothing else holds. We understand the fact that young people are not only the future of whatever country, but they are also our present hope. And so we must, as a matter of urgency, we must begin to proactively look at how do we solve these issues in a more direct approach. And the how has been presented. Now it's time for action. Now it's time for activating that collaboration. Now it's time for pushing the proven solution to market and making it accessible to everybody. Yes, on blended learning, that's a very brilliant point. And that's what we do. We started a pilot project of the Ready for Work with blended uh, learning where we distribute content through emails and you know um, other channels that we use. But of course, as the program grows, we are looking to make it accessible to people wherever they are. The technicalities are something I cannot say specifically on the call, but blended learning is a, a very good approach. But we understand also that to reach people at scale, we need to leverage heavily the use of technology. And not just technology, we need to design technologies that are reliable and products that have purpose. My own submission will be whatever the cost of action becomes, let's ensure that is hinged on a specific purpose. Our purpose is clear, to unlock the potential of young people and give them sources of livelihood that is meaningful and uh, relevant for today. So we are always looking for partnerships. We are always looking for advice. We're always looking for access to resources that can be useful in, in really getting our work to where it needs to be. So I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk about what we're doing and how collaborations can be sealed and what can be done. So thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you, Madam Jetta, for sharing your mind. It was passionate, it was purposeful, it was true. So thank you so much. And of course, Angeline, thank you, thanks for navigating the back end of the conversation and making it easy for us to interact. So thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody listening. Thank you. Where to find me, sorry, where to find me is uh, sfanonline.org, S-F-A-N-Online.org. Uh, we'll be migrating into our new website. We'll be launching it very this quarter, actually. So when you go there now, you can see some information, but there are so many details that will be uploading online. So expect it to change from what you see, sfanonline.org. You can see us on social media, S-F-A-N online. Of course, you can talk to me personally. I'm always available. Uh, my email is also available, but my social media handle is Tom Chris, M -A -Wulu. Not Tom Cruise, he's the one in the movie. Tom Chris. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very, very, very much, Tom. We really appreciate your contribution. It's, it's fantastic. And let's hope that all of this wish to make, um, to have investment adapted to uh, educational uh, uh, challenges may come. Uh, uh, education don't need help. Education needs investment and long-term uh, actions. Uh, Ms. Ndong Jata, so fantastic. All, all the opportunity you raise, cooperations, open mind. You, you, your role is so complicated, uh, uh, facing so much cultural, pedagogical diversity in Africa, but wishing to bring to everyone the same opportunity. And, 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 and uh, um, knowing that you are open to work with entrepreneurs, civil society is definitely a fantastic message. So thank you very much for your contribution today, um, for your strong uh, commitments behind education. Um, uh, Africa needs people like you. Perhaps you want to make a, a, a last conclusion, and, and, but from Maine Africa, we really would like to thank you for, for your great contribution today, and we give you the floor for a conclusion. Well, thank you very much. I believe uh, much of what I would have uh, wanted to say has been touched on by the two young people. Um, I, I would just leave with a message that, you know, I mean, the idea is to really uh, promote education for well-being and happiness. And happiness cannot happen if really we have um, a poverty, high poverty levels. We have high problems um, with health issues. We have unemployment. 
um, I think when we look at the SDGs, there is SDG 17, which is on partnership. Let's leverage this SDG and see how probably um, through a more proactive collaboration with young people and uh, in initiatives that are ongoing, uh, we may be able to uh, um, begin to work towards uh, managing change in a meaningful way. Because I believe we are all here together on earth uh, to really uh, um, continue uh, the good work uh, that um, others before us have started. Um, uh, we shouldn't really get ourselves into a worsening situation. And to get that improvement happening, the future can be bright with technology coming in and young people out there with great ideas. Uh, I really have learned a lot and I thank you for this opportunity. I will definitely follow up with Tom, Chris and, and Gideon. And thank you, Yuan, and th thank you, um, Angeline. Uh, this was just a wonderful opportunity. I really appreciate it. If there is one word I must leave, it's that our governments must wake up and know the power behind uh, uh, supporting young and innovative, uh, um, you know, uh, creative uh, minds in, in Africa. We cannot continue depending on old people. The older generation have had their turn, but now is the time for the young people. And we must do all that we can to, to really bring together young minds, innovation, and technology to change the education landscape. Thank you very much. Nothing else to add. Fantastic. Let's all work hand in hand for a bright and uh, uh, for the benefits of the common good. We all will benefit from a strong educational program in Africa, not only for Africa, but for the world. Thank you very much for your attending. We wish you a very nice afternoon. We look forward to discuss further. We thank Main Africa for participating to this platform and we look forward to our next plug talk. Have a very good day, have a lovely afternoon and take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.